Well, I wanted to see how you'd react to that. Okay, well, <clears throat> that's my way of saying welcome. If you're at the back of the room and you see other people outside, you can tell them if they don't already know that we're going to start. So welcome to our ninth annual Hawaii Clean Energy Day entitled Pathways to Clean Transportation. Of course, it's focused on clean transportation, uh, not so much on electrical generation as before. Okay, and um, I, I wanted to say thanks for being here. And it, it all, it occurs to me looking around, we know each other, we know so many of each other, and we're all getting older in these Clean Energy Day programs, ex <laughs> except for one person, that's uh, Sharon Moriwaki, she is not getting older, not you, Ben. <laughs> I'm already old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she wanted me to mention to you that uh, there's a lot going on today, some of it across the street with respect to transportation, like for example, a special session of the legislature. Okay, so <clears throat> this is important and should be somehow connected with what's going on across the street. We'll hear a lot more about that. Make no mistake, transportation is critical for community, security, health, well-being of our society. It's also a big challenge and a big opportunity. Moving people, moving goods, moving services is central to our economy and our quality of life day by day. If done right, it will generate huge benefits. And at the very least, it will save billions right here. So we want your Manau today. We want to do this Clean Energy Day a bit differently than perhaps before. We have lots of panel presentations, but we also, today, we want your input for sure. We're going to capture it with our meeting SIF technology, and later on, we'll do something we haven't done so much before. We're going to report it out we're going to report it to the public, to the media, to every channel we can. Uh, what you say really counts today especially. So please stay with us and listen and then speak to express yourself on clean energy, clean transportation, so we can get your input. So let's first take a moment to say hi to be sure. Turn to your left, turn to your right, turn in front, turn in back, say hello to your neighbors, give them your business card, and tell them why you're here, ask them why they're here, and what their expectations are. You got one minute, go. Okay, although we don't always agree on things, today on Hawaii Clean Energy Day, we're celebrating our engagement and our collaboration in a process that's kind of unique to Hawaii. We have a lot to celebrate for the progress we've had in electrical generation, and we hope to have the same success in transportation, but we have to work at it. It's hard to reduce fossil fuels in transportation. People are wedded to them. This sector is so diverse, so complex, there are so many options. Electric uh, vehicles, public transportation, renewable fuels, smart zoning, and on and on. Lots of people trying to get clean energy into transportation. You'll hear from some uh, figures in that regard today. What's happening, what's not happening, our strengths and our weaknesses. We also have great exhibits, even a chance to see the two new Tesla models. I saw one on the way in, right outside. And the newest of the EV bikes, for example. Uh, so see, see the cars outside in the courtyard. And that's the alley right behind the, the Y here. And also visit the sponsor tables under the tent, nice tent, in the breezeway. Um, and take a look. Say mahalo to the people who are there. All for you, all to make this an interesting um, and uh, discovery experience on Clean Energy Day. And we'll hear from David Ige on the state of uh, Hawaii's clean energy. And, and he'll help us uh, present this year's Transformational Achievement Awards. So where are we on clean transportation? What do we aspire to? Big question. What does success look like? Big question. What's the pathway like? And what do we do to get there now? We have assembled a program to update, update you and to also inspire each of you to take action, or at least to express yourselves and give us input. But first, Here's Sharon Moriwaki. It's like, here's Johnny. Here's Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the forum, 
tell us why the forum chose this particular theme in this particular year, on this particular Energy Day, <laughs> and what it means to us. Ready? Go. Thank you, Jay. And thank you to all of you for being here and part of the Clean Energy Day today. As Jay said, sustainable transportation is critical, but challenging. It can be contentious, as we know. But there's, that's why the forum is focusing on clean transportation. And we're hopeful, with the support of State Transportation Director Ford Fujikami, Fujigami, I always get that wrong, Fujigami, uh, this wasn't the case in the past. In 2008, the forum first pursued energy efficient strategies to reduce imported fossil fuel and ground transportation, convening a 24 member working group of business, labor, academia, and government. We actually came up and came up with a consensual vision for an energy efficient transportation system, 2008. It offered people choices in modes, fuels, and vehicles at acceptable cost. They were presented at the forum's fifth annual Clean Energy Day in 2013. We had quality discussions on alternative fuels, energy efficient vehicles, public transportation, non-motorized mobility, and land use policies. Good discussions, but we needed an agreement on vision, goals, actions. Actions and strategies were elusive. In 2014, the State Office of Energy contracted with ICCT, that's uh, the International Council on Clean Energy Transportation, to assess progress and identify strategies to reduce fossil fuel in transportation. But without DOT involvement, uh, it was incomplete. When Ford Fuchigami took the helm at DOT, he, his openness to change led to some new ideas and more dialogue and collaboration, and to House Bill 1580, proposed in the 2017 legislature to reduce and eliminate fossil fuels and ground transportation by 2045. But it did not pass. That brings us to today. Hoping to go beyond aspirational goals, to get closer to the realities and each other, to find, articulate, and publish meaningful consensus, to galvanize political will. And that means to take action. Wow. You heard it here at Clean Energy Day. We're going to do it. So we designed the day to lead to output, to refresh our vision and our goals, to identify and examine tangible actions, to create pathways to attain those goals. And we intend, as Jay said, to report to policymakers and the public on the goals, the actions, and the pathways you propose. The morning panelists will tell you where we are, their goals and achievements to date. Our morning keynote, Craig Dirksen, will tell us the Portland story on vision to action. In the afternoon, we'll hear from various speakers on their visions, metrics of success, and how they propose to attain them. And Eric Sunquist from State Smart Transportation Initiative will tell us how other jurisdictions work this through. All this to lead to our dialogue session where you can integrate this and see if you can come up to consensus on what needs to be done. Quite ambitious, I'd say. But as Robert Kennedy used to say, if not now, when? And if not us, who, right? It's an experiment in working together to tackle the state's most demanding challenge. I hope staying the course with us today, you will feel the importance of this job that we have before us. You're all critical players, and we want to hear from each of you what you have to say. Mafalo and aloha for joining us. Jay. You know, she does get younger, I tell you. So um, what about you, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Carol Fukunaga? I keep wanting to call you Senator, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you think of Sharon's remarks? Any, any good? Okay, okay. We have another Council Member, do Council Member Kelly King. Kelly, 
Council Member King. What do you think of Sharon's remarks? <laughs> All right, moving forward. Now we want to start our decision-making process with meeting SIFT. Take out your cell phones, if you don't have them out already, and get online for the Q&A. Go to YWCA hyphen Laniakea, L-A-N-I-A-K-E-A, and then put in, uh, that's a Wi-Fi, huh? and then put password in, in caps, YWCA hyphen guest 1040, okay, YWCA guest 1040. Hmm. Wait a minute, that's not it. You want to get on, okay. <clears throat> Okay, then you go to SIFT, S-I-F-T-L-Y, and enter participant code H-C-E-D-9, as indicated. Okay, so password YWC hyphen guest 1040, and it has nothing to do with tax, tax reform, nothing. Okay, what? Well, that's at the bottom of the program. If you look on the program, you can make reference to that. It's on the first page, the back to the first page, yeah. Okay, if you have a problem with any of that, if you are challenged by that, <clears throat> raise your hand if you dare, and a volunteer will come to help you. No embarrassment. And uh, if you don't have a mobile device, you can use the index cards. Carl Friedman, would you, would you hold an index card up? Okay, that's Michelle, an index card. So you can get those instead of using the mobile device for Q&A. Okay, first we're gonna have some questions of you, if you don't mind, so we know what's going on. Demographics, if you will. Let's find out who's here. So the first questions are about to pop up on the screen. Watch this. <laughs> oh, there it is, okay. What category best describes you? A, business professional. B, environmentalist. C, government official. D, educator. E, student. An F interested citizen. Find a place for yourself among those categories. All right? What do we got? Now we can all see what's going on. Wow. Wow. Educator. Is that my right? Am I am I colorblind? Is everybody is an educator here? No? Yeah? What? No. What's that 46%? What is that one? Business professional. Business professional, okay. All right, now, you, now we know who you are and you knew who you are. Okay, okay, the next question is, what is your interest in being here? Uh, A, I want to get updated on what's happening in clean energy. B. I'm interested in the topics and want to learn more. C, I want to meet and network with the energy community. Good idea. Okay. Uh, D, I support clean energy transportation awardees. So that's good. And E, I really like the speakers. That's why I'm here. Okay. So let's see what you think about that. Okay. All right. Very good. So most people what? Most people are looking for an update and we will give them that. Okay, next question, just to understand the demographic again. Watch this, oh. How much do you know about clean transportation? One, A. I work in the area and or I am an expert in the area. I like that one. B, I enjoy reading about and learning more about it. Uh, C, I am interested and know a little about it. And D, I don't know much about it, but I'm interested in learning about it. Okay, what do we got? Hmm. Hmm. Well, a lot of people are in the area and our experts. So we have to keep this discussion at a very high level. That's clear. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Ah, meeting shift, wonderful. Okay, good. You can keep that page on your browser open and send in questions on the panel discussions as you think of them. But know that the, that the meeting shift technology is limited to 100 characters. That's probably a good thing. So that's like a tweet, although tweet, you know, to some people is a dirty word these days. Uh, Carl Friedman and Mike Hamnett will be working with Michelle Daigle to get as many questions as possible, to get to as many questions as possible and give you answers uh, in the time we have. Okay, so we're going to go to the first panel. Huh? Ready? Huh? As you may remember, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative was rolled out in 2008. What is that? S -s -s nine years ago. Sometimes we have forgotten where we said we were going. Not me. I know there are some people out there. And we have wandered off course without realizing it. That's why the Forum's uh, Energy Day program is so important annually. We identify the sea changes. We remember, or we try hard to remember where we said we were going and, and also to adjust our course because that's what you've got to do in a transformation. So today we're here for a reality check. 2017. As always, we want our speakers to be totally candid. Candid. Did I say candid? We want them to tell us what we've achieved or not, for better or for worse. And as we did in our 2013 annual Clean Energy Day, that was our fifth one, we want to check on clean transportation, focus on that today. So how far along are we on that? What's missing? What do we need to do to get where we're going, wherever that is? As you can see from the bios, everybody have the, the, bio, the bio book, the bio book, okay. We've assembled powerful panels and experts, and we've reserved time for Q&A, as I mentioned, and also time for you to discuss goals and actions, those are magic words, for the coming months and years. We absolutely have to do that. That is the payload here today. So let's start with what's happening. We've asked the panelists to highlight the goals and achievements you should know about, Five minutes apiece, and then we'll have Q&A. So to keep the panelists to their five minutes, we have our trusty timekeeper who's now going to stand up and wave back to you so you'll know. There he is. There he is. His, his, his initials are carved in that seat, by the way. A big hand for Stan Osserman. General Stan Osserman. General of all armies, Stan Osserman. A, a great and faithful timekeeper and much more. Stan is the hydrogen coordinator for our state with great things to come. And don't forget to ask questions on meeting shift on index cards or otherwise as we go along. If you need to have index cards, let us know. Okay, Carl Friedman is the forum's go-to guy on the essential facts and figures you need to know. Uh, he's been working for a number of years on our metrics project. And you can see in this, the stats in a portal on our website which is hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu, okay? Uh, so Carl, tell us, where are you, Carl? Carl, will you, tell, will you please tell us how we are doing? Uh, let's see, take, take that one, take that one. That's Carl Friedman. A big welcome, a warm welcome for Carl Friedman. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I have two jobs today. I was asked to do a status report on how we're doing, just as gen general as that, and also to report on some survey results of a transportation public opinion survey that the forum has done this year. Um, so to keep things quick, I'm going to uh, go back to our metrics. If you look at our metrics website, there are three basic messages that have been there for years, but they kind of stay the same at the 60,000 foot level. Uh, one message is that we are making progress in the electric sector. I'm just going to do this for the slide. Yeah, so the next slide. Uh, and as you can see there, we have some identifiable uh, effects from energy efficiency and renewable energy that are lowering the level of fossil generation uh, that we have. Uh, the second message there is, uh, despite our progress, we have a long way to go. And if you look at those same two sectors with the whole barrel, you can see that they're actually a pretty small part of where we might want to go eventually. And a, a big part of that, of course, is uh, transportation use. Uh, 
The third, and that, that, that brings us to the third message, which is transportation is a real challenge. And it's a real challenge for several reasons. One is just the amount. Uh, a lot of the fuel that we use is for transportation. Um, and also it's a growing proportion of the energy use. As we reduce the amount we're using in the electrical power sector, the focus is going to be increasingly on transportation to reduce the state's fossil use. It's challenging for a number of reasons. It, unlike the electric sector, it's not regulated by a single uh, entity or primarily hooked up to one system that you can measure with meters. With, uh, it's actually very diverse. There are lots of different pieces. Um, just breaking down transportation fuels, uh, and I stole this slide from, this slide from the ICCT study, 53% of the fuels go to cars and like trucks and another seven. So about 60% is ground transportation. There are two sectors, aviation and marine, which, and state policy and actions don't really have too easily effect on those. Those are uh, not quite as accessible by state actions. But even within those sectors of the ground transportation, there are lots of players. We have uh, the DOT, we've got state planners, uh, the bus, uh, uh, rapid transit, county planners, county DOTs, uh, many different entities. And for each of those, uh, there are a number of uh, solutions or approaches or different types of things, all of which are going to have to be uh, uh, put together. Uh, we got to this by way of energy. I mean, we're the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and I think some of the state of the legislative objectives about transportation, some of the impetus for that is a concern about energy. But transportation is about a lot more than just energy. So it's not just clean transportation, it's smart transportation. There are, energy is just one piece of the transportation puzzle. And in terms of the metrics, I mean, I'm supposed to give you a report on where we're at, right? I can't do that. We, I think in the transportation sector, we're just at the point of figuring out what are our state's aspirations, what are the objectives and the goals and the specific programs uh, and plans for each of the agencies that are involved. So before we can come up with an overall report card, before we can even come up with the basic metrics, we're kind of at the stage now of just enunciating and figuring out what all the different players are going to be doing, how they're going to how they're going to work together. So, uh, I mean, I put fuel up there as a metric. Be, we are the forum here. That's kind of how fuel relates to ground transportation, uh, vehicle miles traveled, and I put that up there in part. I mean, if you look out there, supposedly by the da state data, this is straight off the state data. We had this huge increase and a big drop and another increase again. I mean, I don't really believe that. But th th the message there is we really have to look at refining our, uh, our metrics uh, to, uh, to move forward with um, uh, measuring what we should know even historically. So I want to turn uh, to the next uh, job I have here. There were, there have been two uh, public opinion uh, uh, surveys done by the forum, one in 2009, one in 2017. And I looked at that, I was trying to make some analysis of what the changes were. They really weren't designed to have be benchmarked and, and go one to the other. But I thought I'd just quickly flip through some of the findings of the more recent uh, survey. The, I'm going to go through two questions. Which, the first question is, which of the following are you willing to do to address our transportation problems? So this was, uh, this was asked on telephone interviews, uh, 499 completed interviews in all the different counties. No, they didn't have to choose. It's just for each of the following options. It's just, you know, would you be willing to do this to address our transportation problems? So the first one, use the bus or other public transportation that is available. 40% said. These are kind of in rough descending order. So that was the highest percentage there. Uh, walk instead of driving, 28%. Bike instead of driving, 21%, one in five. 
buy and use an electric vehicle or other fuel efficient vehicle, 28%. But I say about this, asked a different way in the same survey, 78, 77% said they'd be willing to do this if you ask it, ask the question. And that's up from a, like 35% uh, back in 2009. So the willingness or the awareness of uh, electric vehicles seems to be going up. Uh, support funding for the state to bring in cheaper and cleaner fuels, 21%. Support funding for driverless cars, 14%. Support higher taxes on fuels to support renewable fuels, such as hydrogen, biodiesel, biofuels. And I know whenever the word funding is in there, the percentages go down. And now taxes, whenever the word taxes is in there, they go way down. Uh, next one is, oh, so that's it for that question. The next question uh, that I'm going to report out is, what should the state and county government do to address our transportation problems? So there we have improved the public transportation system, 51%, by far the largest yes we got on any of that. Uh, invest in expanding and improving roads, 29%. Provide tax incentives for locally grown renewable fuels, 27%. Even with the word tax in it, you know, so, okay. Develop a plan to eliminate fossil fuels in ground transportation by 2045. Spend dollars on more EV charging stations, 17%. Uh, invest in our harbors to bring in more cost competitive fuels, 14%. And tax fossil fuel vehicles, 13%. Support use of autonomous or driverless cars, 13%. And go to the next slide just for, for a second. If you go to our website, you can get a lot of this stuff, um, all these, in, you know, in more detail, downloadable spreadsheet forms if you're a data junkie. Uh, and I think we're going to have those public opinion polls up there too. So you'll be able to get the full results of those pu public opinion polls on the website. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Carl Friedman. <laughs> and we're making a movie for a uh, broadcast on OC16 cable. Uh, of this seminar, this conference, and we'll include that, uh, these parts of that in the movie. Okay, Ford Fujigami, director of the State Department of Transportation. One of the leaders in clean, clean transportation is, of course, the director of the State Department of Transportation, Ford Fujigami. Before Ford was appointed as director, we had the hardest time bringing DOT to our energy table. But Ford now leads a sustainable transportation forum that has grown to 120 member organizations. Truly impressive. Ford has a lot to share on where we are in achieving his goals in sustainable transportation. So I know it's a, a challenge for him to tell all this in five minutes. So we're asking Ford to talk fast. Okay? A big hand for Director Ford Fujigami. Ford, where are you? Ah. Thank you, Ford. Jay, you're absolutely correct. There's no way I'm going to get this done in five minutes, but I'm going to try. <laughs> you, you know, if you don't mind, I asked him to put up one of Carl's slides up here. How do we do this? Up? You know, actually, everything that Carl talked about, we're actually doing right now. So, but again, I don't. I only have five minutes. I'm going to talk real fast, and I'm going to try to get through this. You know, um, one of the things that the airport highways and harbors has been doing is been taking a look at all the different fuels that we were kind of been looking at. Uh, people ask us, what have we been doing? And this is basically what I was, we've been working with the harbors division for quite some time. We've been working with the shipping companies. I think you heard recently that Tote came out and they said that they want to do business in Hawaii as a third shipping company. Tote basically put on the table for me four ships. Uh, they heard that, they, that I've been talking about LNG field ships. So they're willing to go ahead and order four LNG ships to do business in the state of Hawaii. Three days after that, Pesha, who's already doing business in the state of Hawaii, put in an order for two LNG field ships. We've been talking about this in 2015, and now people are listening to what we have to say. The last screen that we took a look at with the pie chart, I believe it said that, uh, I'm trying to memorize it, 
14% was marine fuel, and that's something that we're kind of trying to take a look at. The other division basically is airports division. Airports, again, jet fuels. Uh, airlines are finally starting to use biofuels. United actually bought into a biofuel company so that they can uh, supply source. I visited them in, in LA. They're actually using it. I know Alaska Airlines is doing this as well. But as far as the state is concerned, what can we do? What we're doing is basically we're adding more gates so that people, in terms of jets, are not sitting on our taxi lanes burning more jet fuel. We're uh, rolling out two projects. One is called preconditioned air. Right now that they have to run their auxiliary power units, which again is fueled by jet fuel, uh, to keep these air conditioners running. By putting in preconditioned air units, they can shut off their engines. We're also putting in ground power. Ground power is very important, so their equipment basically does not have to run as well. So these are just some of the things that we're doing so that we can take on these two major roles. Uh, the one that you just passed, yeah. If you take a look at it, 12% in marine, 28% in airports. By us doing what we're doing, we're reducing the consumption, and that's how you reduce fossil fuel usage. And we work very hard at it. Now this is my biggest project at TARP. I've actually started a study to use different type of uh, renewable energy fuels. I've brought literally everybody into this. We're looking at electric vehicles, we're looking at CNG, and we're looking at hydrogen. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on and the pro report is actually gonna be ready for publication on September 6th. Once that report comes out, we're actually gonna do a pilot program. Uh, we're gonna test all three pilot programs in terms of the three different, different types of fuel. We've already started this with biofuels, with B20, uh, and we're actually running it now. But our intent basically is not only to take the expert uh, report that we got, but to apply that through a pilot program to see, in fact, you know, what effect it has. We're just not trying to look at the most effective renewable energy use, but we need to look at the impact it has on our engines, the impact it has on maintenance, what is the overall cost, how do we generate these fuels, and again, our goal is that everything needs to be generated through re renewable energy. This is a very, very important project for us. You know, one of the things that people are asking me is, Ford, where are you getting all the money to do this? This money is not coming out of the airports. It's not coming out of general fund. Basically, I've convinced the airline, um, the consolidated car rental people to take funds out of their pocket to go ahead and do this. This study is costing me $640,000. But based on this study, we can apply this literally to any department within the state. And this right now revolves around uh, commercial vehicles and eventually we'll get to private vehicles. Now that being said, again, as Carl has indicated, the, also the, the other thing that I'm looking at, and this is one of governor's initiatives, is, is autonomous vehicles. How do we do autonomous vehicles in the state of Hawaii? We actually have a study going on right now on that as well, okay? A little bit more challenging fact a lot more challenging, especially when you try to do it around the airports, when you have a lot of stop and go, you have a lot of people walking around, it's not an easy task. You know, first thing they came out to me and says, listen, can you do it through protected lanes, dedicated lanes? The answer was no, absolutely not. Now, I'm told that it's being done in Reno, it's being done at other places, we're gonna be taking a look at that, but that's another thing that we're working on. So despite everything you, you hear about how do we get to the next step? The Department of Transportation is moving. We're spending money wisely to get there. And again, I believe that we're using all the experts in the industry, not only in the state of Hawaii, but the consulting group that I brought on board, the Boston Consulting Group, uh, is known for their expertise in this particular area, and that's one of the reasons why we hired them. That being said, that's my five-minute report. Thank you. Thank you, Ford. Ford, for a moment, just for a moment, I'd like to be your nephew. <laughs> and from, you know, your vision down the roadway, well, that you, roadway is an you know, explicit term, um, and, you know, what's going to happen in transportation and energy going forward. We have at least two possibilities for, you know, driver transportation, aside from bicycles and, and uh, public transit, but let's talk about vehicles for a minute. So we have Stan here, he's going to talk about hydrogen. He will, okay? And the other possibility, of course, is electric vehicles. And if I'm your nephew, and I am teetering about buying an energy efficient, or rather a, a fossil fuel less car, what do you think I should consider? What are the factors and which one? I'm your nephew now, so you have to talk to me as your nephew. 
You know, it's very difficult. You know, I got Shelly back there, who I'm working very closely with when it comes to electric vehicles. I got General Osterman, to be honest with you, at the last meeting I told him that I'm not doing hydrogen vehicles anymore because of the fact that unfortunately he didn't get his $3 million from the legislature. But of course, General being the general, he came to see me the next day and we're still doing hydrogen vehicles. And again, CNG, you know, uh, Joseph came to see me as well. So at this time, I would tell my nephew, wait till September 6th, wait till my pilot program is done, and then I can give you a positive answer that I can back it up with information. <laughs> How's that for an answer? That's great, Ford. Thank you, Ford. Ford Fujigami. So appreciate you coming down. <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna to talk to uh, Chris Yunker now. Chris Yunker is the Energy Systems and Planning Program Manager at the State Energy Office. He led uh, the ICCT transportation study that uh, Sharon and Carl mentioned earlier. Um, he is the go-to person to ask about the state's clean energy goals and clean transportation. How about a warm welcome for Chris Yunker? Chris? Oh, you're right there. <laughs> I'm keeping this time limit serious, so I'm going to keep the script here and, and try to get through everything fast. What I did want to do is just start with a little bit of Energy Office's vision of the energy landscape in Hawaii because it impacts how we look at things. And that's one, we want energy independence, we want environmentally and culturally sound, and we want to add value to the businesses and people of Hawaii. And to that end, we can look to the 100% RPS, we can look at to the adoption of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we also have Act 38, which looks at the ultimate elimination of fossil fuels in electric generation and ground transportation. And so that kind of guides our thoughts and what we're looking to do and why we want to push so hard for progress now. So what have we been up to? The ICCT report has been brought up. It identified 22 tactics and potentially 72 million gallons per year that could be reduced by 2030. And those are incremental tactics in addition to the like, baseline activities. But what I wanted to bring up and what's been highlighted here is the impetus for that report was because we weren't making progress that we feel we needed to in order to meet those goals and objectives that were already out there like the 70% uh, reduction in fossil fuels and HCEI. And so that's really what we've been focused on, is trying to create pathways for progress going forward. And so to that end, everybody knows that it takes a variety of stakeholders to make any successful transportation project, which is why we've been engaging in a couple of collaborative uh, environments, the Drive Electric Hawaii, uh, that includes many of the players here, the Department of Transportation, Consumer Advocate, Ulupono, HECO, KIUC, Blue Planet, and that's really just focusing on the reduction of fossil fuel in ground transportation, but specifically through electrification of transportation. Um, another thing is that we're active supporters of DOT's Sustainable Transportation Forum, and one of the big things there is that, of course, we're aligned with them in that they are the ones that are discussing a number of the topics that are supported by analysis in the ICCT report. Um, Another activity that we've been up to with the support and collaboration of DOT and the counties and the Economic Development Board is the submittal of successful applications for electric drive transportation corridors. And that just lays out on the Big Island, in, or on Oahu and Maui, uh, electric drive corridors that uh, map out essentially pathways that we want to build out electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And we're gearing up now to develop proposals for both uh, the Big Island and Kauai. But that brings us to one of the bigger things that we have going in the Energy Office right now, which is the Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust. That's uh, eight and an eighth million dollars that we receive from the state of Hawaii, or the state of Hawaii received from that mitigation trust, and the Hawaii State Energy Office has been designated the lead agency in administering that project. It's primarily focused on medium and heavy duty vehicles, However, 15% of those funds can be allocated towards the development of electric drive uh, fueling infrastructure or charging infrastructure. And so the details of this will are forthcoming. They have a trust, but the trust has not been finalized. Once that trust is finalized, it will set in uh, place a series of actions that all states need to take in order to roll that out. Uh, we will be putting up a website uh, at the Hawaii State Energy Office, as well as developing a means by which stakeholders and 
Really, any individual can provide comments on eligible mitigation actions. And so to that end, we expect, while everything is still up in the air because it's all dependent on when the trust is finalized, we're expecting something in the mid-October range is when we're hoping to get back. Um, but that's not the only thing that's available through Volkswagen. The settlement, oh, I got one minute. The settlement um, also made for Electrify America. And what that is is a separate pot of funds that looks to develop charging infrastructure throughout the nation. Uh, we have been working with stakeholders to support their proposals, and in particular, we're the technical advisor to the Pacific Historic Parks, which is looking to, char or to site uh, level two and fast chargers at iconic locations around Hawaii. And we're looking to leverage things like that particular project, along with the 15% in the environmental, environmental mitigation fund, as well as activities with HECO, with their fast charger program, to make sure that we're developing and building out those transportation corridors that have already been identified. And with that, I think I made it under the wire. Thank you, Chris Younger. So it strikes me when I buy my electric car or my hydrogen car, as the case may be, I want to follow those corridors. It's like TOD on rail. You want to be where the action is. So if I'm a, an investor in real property, for example, I might want to be close to those charging stations. I know people will go that way. You know. <laughs> okay, Lee Steinmetz. Lee Steinmetz does multimodal planning on Kauai. He was here last year with uh, Bernard Carvalho, uh, Hawaii's... Uh, High energy mayor, high energy mayor. If anybody used that term before, you can use it now. Okay, uh, one of our transformational achievement uh, uh, awardees last year. So he comes today to give us a, an update on clean transportation in Kauai. How well has uh, Kauai done, Lee? Uh, tell us a warm welcome for Lee Steinmetz. Thank you. It's really it's really great to be here today. Thank you, and I want to. Um, add the welcome or the hellos, the greetings from our high energy mayor, Mayor Carvalho, who's a huge supporter of sustainable transportation and a leader on our island in making that happen. Okay, I gotta do a double thing here. So what I wanted to do first is just talk about various alternatives as we move forward and then talk about what Kauai is doing. On this chart, which I have to give Ben Sullivan a, a thank you, a shout out for turning me on to this. This is from some great research that's going on at UC Davis. But anyway, this first column that you see on the left is what happens if we just keep going down the same road of uh, the types of vehicles that we have and pretty much relying on single occupancy vehicles. You can see the number of cars that we'll have on the road. This is looking at the US, but by 2050, and the amount of carbon emissions that we'll have. The second scenario is if we look at electrification and automation. And a lot of the discussion, of course, this is an energy discussion, but has been on fuel type. And you can see that the number of cars stays pretty much the same. So the amount of congestion that we'll have will basically be the same. The type of commitment we need to do in building more roads will be the same, which we don't have money for. But we do see a reduction in carbon emissions. If we look at the third scenario, it's combining that idea of electri electrification and, and automation with also shifting the types of trips that we have. So looking at transit as part of our mix as expanding that looking at shared cars, and looking at bicycle and pedestrian trips. If we look at that as a whole comprehensive package of how we address transportation, you'll see there's a significant reduction in the number of cars on the road, which means our congestion problems will be much better, as well as a much higher reduction in carbon emissions. So this third, this 3R scenario that you see on the right, this is the direction that Kauai is going, and I want to share with you some of the things that we're doing to get there. So, and I'm going to talk less about fuel type and some of the other things that we're doing. So first of all, at a planning level, at a high level planning level, we're looking at community plans that encourage infill development as opposed to sprawl development. So that we're reducing the need for car trips and expanded roadways. Uh, we're also heavily investing in street retrofits of existing streets to add sidewalks, bike lanes, transit facilities so that our streets are safer and more friendly and accommodating for all types of users. We're developing new street design standards for our new roads that, again, look at not just cars, but how do pedestrians and bicyclists and transit users, how does everybody use these roads safely together? On the transit sector, we're doing some transit planning, um, and I want to focus on visitors. The model on Kauai, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to move this forward. Thank you, Mike. Um, so 
On the transit end, we're looking at new models of how visitors get around our island. Right now, 89% of visitors at the airport rent a car for the week or however long they're staying. So now we're looking at can we have affordable shuttles that get people from the airport to their resort areas? Can we have resort area shuttles that move people around plus bike share, plus walking? Um, and good pedestrian facilities. So instead of renting a car for a week at your hotel, you can rent a car for a day or two for the big trip you want to do around the island, and the rest of the time you don't need a car. And then in addition to those planning and infrastructure things, we're also looking at various programs like Safe Routes to School to encourage walking and biking at a very local neighborhood level. Now, as has occurred many places in our state, we're having some pushback to this approach. Anytime there's change, people, people uh, are opposed to change. So we're having to refigure a lot about how we move forward with this. And I want to talk about some of the things that we're doing. We're retooling our community involvement so that we get people involved at the very beginning at a very grassroots level. And instead of the county proposing something, these ideas are coming from the neighborhood and coming from the community. And they're coming forward and saying, we want this, instead of feeling like it's being imposed. We've started to have some community events, like we just hosted Rice Roll in our Lihui Town Core, where we also have our Tiger Project, so that we get people on bicycles. We had a lot of people participate in this who had never ridden a bicycle before, who wanted to, but they just didn't feel it was safe. And now we have people who are actually buying bikes because they're seeing the value of this and they're wanting to actually start riding their bike for recreation, but also for transportation. We have a fun event coming up, our Rice Street Block Party, Shout out to Alex Wong, who's in the audience, who created this flyer, this poster. But our Tiger Project started as something that the county was, was doing, and it was supported by the community and the business. Now it's shifting to the business community by hosting and organizing this event. They're taking responsibility, they're taking ownership, and the county instead is supporting the community and the businesses instead of the other way around. So we're starting to see this transformational shift and ownership of these ideas by the community and business groups. And I also want to say, as we move forward with this and we think of this pushback, we're having to rethink our message. Um, quite, we see this at a national level too, right? A lot of people really aren't wanting to talk about climate change, aren't wanting to talk about global warming, don't really want to talk about bike lanes. But if we think of communication and things that people care about, like safety of children, safety of all road users, if we think of economic development, if we think of all of these various messages, that are what people are actually interested, but also are accomplished through sustainable transportation, then we can bring more people into the tent and we can, we can have those people become supporters. Okay, last slide is I just want to mention on the app and the high tech side is looking at seamless integration across modes of transportation. So how do you get from a bike to a bus? How do you pay for these things? Can we have like a seamless type of way to pay for various modes of transportation and also cross jurisdictions? Some of our roads are DOT, some are county. How do we work together? And also thinking that some of these transportation modes are actually going to be provided by private people like um, Uber, like Lyft. How do we work across private and public provisions of transportation? Thank you. Oh, sorry. One last thing, we were supposed to talk about things that we're measuring, so I won't go into this, but here's a list of the things that we're actually measuring on Kauai to see how we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Steinmetz. You know, one of the things that strikes me from your remarks is that if you, if you reduce or you maintain the same level of vehicles on the road, not only do you avoid um, congestion, because you have fewer cars, um, or the same cars, but you also avoid the need to spend money on additional infrastructure to handle additional congestion. So that's another benefit of this uh, multimodal approach you're taking. Yes, that's absolutely right. And um, HDOT has very wisely set out that they are only going to work on system preservation and not invest funds in capacity building because of the lack of funds that we have. So this is a very real issue in our state. And another reason to support this idea of mode shift so that we can get people to where they want to go and reduce congestion and give everybody an opportunity for mobility, even people who aren't able to drive. Thank you, Lee Steinmetz.
Okay, we can talk from, uh, we talk with Mike Packard now, Complete Streets Program Administrator for the City and County of Honolulu in the Department of Transportation Services. So the city has focused plenty of attention on bikes and, and, and Beaky, and Complete uh, Streets with its new program administrator, Mike Packard, we've asked him to uh, give us an update on the clean transportation programs now happening in Honolulu. A big hand for Mike Packard. Mike, thanks for coming down. Thank you so much, Jay, and it's, and it's excellent to follow up with these, these great speakers so far, and, and they really have led right into um, what I'm gonna talk to you about this morning. And that's about our, our newly created Complete Streets program. And, and while it's new in the program, it's not new in what we've been doing for some time. You know, the state legislation, state legislators passed the bill in 2009 requiring the counties to consider Complete Streets and all of what we did. 2012, the city and county passed the ordinance which required the city to look at multimodal transportation and everything that we do. So when we consider accessibility and equity, it's making sure people can get where they need to go as easily and safely as they need to. Um, just last year, we finalized our Complete Streets Manual, at which time this program officially started. So the program is new, however, we've been taking these steps for some time to, to move in this same direction. You know, the reason we are here and, and the opportunity is that urban Honolulu is changing. You can't tell, you look, a, take a step outside and you see the cranes. You know, that's really just adhering to the demand and the need for the increased housing. With rail comes that opportunity to increase our density, which plays into what, ju just like what Lee was saying, in that if we can keep people within tight, close areas, the ability to take that transformation and choose to walk or choose to bike or choose to take a short bus ride or rail, you know, those are the opportunities to actually get people out of their vehicles. And the truly clean energy is using your feet, walking and biking, as opposed to, you know, having that, that hook and that need to use your vehicle to get where we need to go. Because when we spend our money on prioritizing vehicles, whether it's providing the throughput or places for them to park, you know, we're not really being equitable as it relates to others and what they need. You know, Bike Share is a system that the city and state have supported. It's a nonprofit organization, but just to show the, the demand that exists there, in the first month, Bike Share tallied upwards of 50,000 rides. That's on par with Portland, Oregon. And if any, any of you have been to Portland and see the infrastructure that exists there to support those types of rides, you see the demand that we have. So with that, we really need to take those steps to be able to provide for all users. And when we're talking complete streets, it is not just bicyclists. And often that gets mixed up but in, in what we're trying to advocate for, but it's really livability making an area where people want to be, where people want to stay, where they want to provide, you know, for the economic development of that area that improves our communities, that allows our elderly to age in place, and it provides for our keiki so that parents can allow and choose to have their kids walk or bike to school as opposed to feeling that need and demand to drive them because the infrastructure and considering it not being safe. But it also goes back to smart growth. By increasing our density, by providing multimodal access and accessibility, we really can get where we need to go. <clears throat> Some of the initiatives that we have over the next couple of years is the build out of the bike network. You know, this supports a lot of what we're doing with Bicky, but in addition, you know, building out that accessibility and network so we can get where we need to go. Recently, you've seen the McCulley bike lanes and the South Street bikeway. This is the way that we will be going to, to ensure that a network can be provided, not just in our urban core, but when repaving projects come up, we are taking that opportunity to relook at the way our roads have been striped. This example from Kamehameha 4 in Kalihi took a four-lane road and provided better accessibility for bicyclists, but in addition to reducing the exposure for pedestrians crossing the street. A couple of programs that we have underway. Uh, we just finished with our downtown Chinatown Complete Streets planning project that goes towards what Lee was saying and got going out to the community and really understanding where they're trying to get. That's looking at providing protected bike lanes, protected intersections, and then sidewalk improvements such as bulb outs and mid-block bulb outs. Additional planning projects that will be underway in the next couple of months include projects in the primary urban core, Nu'uanu and Liliha Street, Kalihi, Waikiki, Pearl City, Kailua, and Kaneohe. 
So this project and this program are taking off and they're being expedited to get where we need to go. And so with that, I, I hope that you guys are part of the discussion and out there to advocate for these types of clean transportation options. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Packard. You know, it strikes me, you gotta reach people, you gotta get them on board with this, and one way to do that is just keep on doing what you're doing. If they walk out their door in the morning and they see all your public works, all your programs happening, it's, it's telling them something and suggesting they get on board, don't you think? Absolutely, Jay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Okay, now we have Mike Madsen, he's environmental engineer with the Department of uh, Health Clean Air Branch. Department of Health Clean Air Branch. Why the Department of Health is, Health is here, you ask? Well, Mike Madsen from the Department of Health Clean Air Branch is an important player in clean transportation. He's gonna tell us about the greenhouse gas emissions, one of the measures we can use to um, assess how well we're doing in reducing petroleum use in ground transportation. So how are we doing, Mike? A warm welcome for Mike Madsen. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm going to talk about um, the greenhouse gas rules and uh, Hawaii state or uh, statewide greenhouse gas emission inventories. Um, let's see. The greenhouse gas rules uh, are required by Hawaii Act 234, and the rules specify. Uh, a statewide greenhouse gas emission limit of 1990 levels by 2020. And this limit uh, excludes international bunker fuel and um, aviation emissions and includes carbon sinks. And uh, international bunker fuel emissions are, would be emissions from ships and planes traveling from Hawaii to other countries. And uh, carbon sinks, uh, an example of carbon sinks would be uh, urban trees or forests that absorb CO2 emissions. And below uh, is a pie chart showing the distribution of emissions for uh, previous statewide greenhouse uh, gas emission inventory uh, provided by ICF to DBED. And this is for 2007. And it shows that uh, most of the statewide greenhouse gas emissions are from the uh, transportation and electric power sectors. Um, um, oh. uh, marine transportation uh, shown in light blue and um, ground transportation shown in orange account for 34% of the statewide greenhouse gas emissions. And the electric power sector accounts for 45% of the statewide greenhouse gas emissions. And our rules do not uh, regulate greenhouse gas emissions from mobile sources in the transportation sector, but they do um, regulate large stationary sources, and most of these sources are in the uh, electric power sector. And um, it's important to note that uh, biogenic CO2 emissions are not counted in the statewide totals. And um, to help meet the uh, greenhouse gas reduction requirements of 1990 levels by 2020, the rules specify um, oh, the rules specify um, a greenhouse gas emission cap for large stationary sources with uh, potential carbon dioxide equivalent emissions greater than or equal to 100,000 uh, tons per year. And the cap is set at 16% below uh, each facility's uh, baseline emission level unless an alternate uh, cap is approved if a 16% reduction cannot be achieved. And 2010 is used as the uh, baseline uh, emission year to establish the cap unless an alternate cap is approved. And um, for the cap, um, biogenic uh, carbon dioxide emissions are excluded to promote the use of biofuels to meet the reductions. And there's uh, 18 affected facilities subject to the cap requirements. Uh, there used to be uh, 20 facilities. Uh, HCNS closed on Maui 
and Shipman uh, Generating Station closed on uh, Hilo, or in Hilo, on the uh, Big Island. And uh, when there were 20 effective facilities, these facilities represented 88% of all Hawaii's stationary source emissions. And the cap, um, let's see, municipal waste combustion operations and landfills with controls are exempt from the, uh, the cap requirement. And the DOH must conduct annual or provide annual reports that uh, determine progress in achieving the statewide greenhouse gas emission limit. And if uh, the DOH determines that the emission limit is met prior to 2020, then no cap is applicable to the effective facilities. And we've contracted ICF um, to provide three annual reports um, over a three-year contract period, and these uh, reports will provide updated emission inventories for the uh, prior inventories, uh, 1990, 2007, and 2010. They'll also provide new emission, statewide greenhouse gas emission inventories for 2015 through 2017, and they'll pro provide greenhouse gas projections for 2020 and 2025. And ICF will also evaluate uh, EPA's state inventory and projection tool for uh, the Clean Air Branch to compile statewide greenhouse gas emission inventories independently. And here's an update, um, uh, updated uh, emission inventories for uh, 1990 and 2007 in blue. And the prior uh, emission inventories are shown in green. And there's a slight increase in the emissions for the updated inventories, about three to four percent due to uh, changes in global warming potentials for the various greenhouse gases, uh, changes in fuel consumption data, and update in greenhouse gas emission factors. And um, let's see, we've received uh, greenhouse gas emission re reduction plans from all 18 affected facilities and we're incorporating caps into the permits for these sources. Uh, DBED, DOT, and DOH are all provide, providing uh, data to ICF for compiling the statewide greenhouse gas emission inventories. And the initial annual report by ICF is uh, expected early in 2018. And the, uh, this annual report will be reviewed by DOH and other state agencies uh, prior to finalizing and posting on our webpage. And in conclusion, uh, statewide greenhouse gas emission inventories will be used to track progress in achieving uh, Hawaii's uh, statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals. And most of the statewide greenhouse gas emissions are from the electric power and transportation sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mike Madsen, Department of Health. We're going to move right along to Lance Tanaka, uh, Director of Government and Public Affairs for PAR Hawaii. Big part of the equation here today is fuels, that is the journey from petroleum to renewables. How do we get there and where are we now? We're very pleased that Lance, uh, PAR Hawaii's Director of Government and Public Affairs um, and the chair of the HEPF's working group, on hydrogen, make that hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon future and energy security is here to tell us. So a warm welcome for our, for our own <laughs> Lance Tanaka. <laughs> yeah, good morning, everyone. You know, with all of the changes that are undergoing here in Hawaii, uh, with regulations and emission standards getting stricter, and of course, all of the great work that the state is doing to move towards clean energy, I sometimes get the question, well, how are you guys going to even stay relevant here, maker of fossil fuels? Well, the quick answer is we plan to be a good partner with the state and local government and to a certain extent with our customers to fill the needs that they have today. And really, with the products that we make today, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, both ultra-low sulfur diesel and high sulfur diesel, these are products that are in demand. So really, the question will be, for the near term, we think fossil, we think liquid fuels will still be um, used in a broad way, 
It may not be totally petroleum, but we feel we have the infrastructure, the expertise, and the machinery and distribution network to play a good role in that. But really, it's really evolving our operation to meet our customers' needs, and that may include making investments for the short term. Um, we see on the horizon there are a lot of things that may displace petroleum, but for the meantime, we need to stay current with the needs of the state, including producing more jet fuel, uh, producing more low sulfur fuels, and that's something that our company recently announced that uh, we have a diesel hydro treated project that we have been uh, given the green light from our board of directors. It's about a $27 million project that we'll use to build a new unit at our refinery, and we're aiming for it to be operational by 2019. And it'll help us to upgrade the high sulfur fuel, which is in low demand right now and getting lower, into something that's uh, more usable for the current um, customer base. But uh, it's just saying that you need to make some incremental investments, even though on the horizon you, know, you don't quite know what's going on. And so this, this second point is really effective management in the refining sector for us is really about building flexibility into your operating model to be responsive to the needs of not just the government but to your customers and really don't spend a lot of time and capital trying to second guess what the future will be. There are a lot of telltale signs out there, the surveys that Ford talk about, I mean, there are a lot of indicators that will uh, foreshadow for us what we can expect, but uh, we're not in the realm of guessing for producing things. Um, primarily, uh, we did say that there's gonna be a lot of uh, liquid fuels in use, but to be honest, uh, there are a lot of great opportunities locally for electric vehicles to make bigger inroads, for the use of hydrogen and all kinds of other alternative fuels. Um, we want to be compatible. We want to see where we fit into that. Uh, it may not be in the same role that we are today, but we're all about evolving with the changing times. Uh, we are supportive of the state's vision. I mean, that's, that's basically what we try to do. We just want to be a good partner. Currently, though, uh, we, we do see a high demand for things like jet fuel and diesel, and we'll continue to produce that. Uh, something that we want to be able to be a reliable supplier, someone that uh, people can come to to supply us, and that's going to be our role right now. But, you know, really, when it comes to feedstock, um, we're really not wedded to oil because we don't own any oil in the ground. We, we don't explore for it or pull it out of the ground. We just buy it on the open market. So we currently tend to benefit from the low crude prices that you see on the market. Uh, but basically, we're agnostic. So we can go a lot of different ways without having to be cow tied to crude oil. And that, I think, gives us a lot of flexibility. So finally, that leads to what are we planning to do? Well, we really would like to be open to any kind of partnership opportunities with local developers who see an opportunity to produce biofuels on a commercial scale. And with that. Thank you, Lance Tanaka. So you're, you're flexible and you're agnostic. And I wonder if you could ever see your way to getting into like <clears throat> electric cars um, or hydrogen. Is that a possibility on the horizon? Is that on the table or off? Well, our model right now is distribution. So providing charging stations, that's totally possible for us. Uh, so again, we have a wide network of distribution for liquid fuels right now, but that could extend to other commodities. That's great. Thank you, Lance. Lance Tanaka. <laughs> okay, we have Greg Gaug, Vice President of Investments at Ulupono Initiative. Um, he is Ulupono's Vice President of Investments. We've asked him here to give his assessment on where we are uh, in, where, we are, where we're at in achieving clean transportation. We'd like from him a candid evaluation of what advances we have made or not. Um, so how are we really, really, really doing, Greg? Uh, a big hand for, for Greg Gao. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I will do my best to address some of that, but I'll be honest, it's gonna go off script a bit. Um, and thanks for uh, the invitation. I'm, you know, honored to be part of this esteemed panel. So we'll dive right in. So where are we? Uh, well, we drive lots of cars. There's lots of cars on the road. I think everybody knows that. I assume pretty much everyone in this room has a car, if not multiple cars. Um, 
and we go lots of places with those cars. We drive lots of miles. The VMT is consumed as data, as was shown previously, uh, continues to you know be stable or increase. And what does that lead to? Lots of imported gasoline and oil consumed in transportation. Roughly one third of the oil uh, imported in the state goes to ground transportation, uh, and that's been the case you know for a long time. And we made some inroads. And the good news is there are solutions. Uh, I view it in kind of four categories here. We have alternative transportation, uh, clean vehicles, alternative fuels, and land use planning. Now, I'll highlight a few of those, um, but as, as was previously mentioned, there's some progress on, on biofuels and there's some progress on, on clean vehicles with electric vehicles um, and hydrogen that is being made not only locally but across the industry as well. So I'm going to focus on the other two, mainly alternative transportation. And this goes into, you know, biking, walking, uh, public transportation, buses, even the rail, uh, which can all be healthier, more convenient, more economical alternatives for everyone in this room and everyone in the state. Uh, as a few examples, you know, the average car costs anywhere from six to 10 grand a year just to own and operate. So that's six to 10 grand kind of out the window for something that you use 5% of the time and 95% of the time it, it just sits there. That's versus, you know, a bus pass or a Bicky pass. You know, bus pass, I get $60 a month. A Bicky pass, you can get roughly $20 a month. Uh, and, you know, with the oncoming rail and other solutions like Uber and Lyft, you start to get an integrated system to, you know, get you out of your car and really replace your car to save that money uh, for other needs. And in addition, not only here but elsewhere, there's a number of other, you know, technologies and opportunities that are growing. Uh, when you think about, you know, car sharing, uh, carpooling technologies and apps, microtransit and others that the good news is are already being done elsewhere and, you know hopefully we can start to attract those and bring, them, bring those to the state and auto autonomous vehicles I think is part of that solution as well. And the other area which I think was hinted on earlier uh, by Lee and Mike is really land use planning uh, and some studies done a while ago indicate that roughly the average American city 40 to 60 percent of the land is used for cars. So between roadways and parkings and parking lots and parking garages, say roughly 50% of urban Honolulu is designated for cars. I mean, it's just a mind-boggling stat, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and so we're really going to run out of room if we keep on expanding streets and adding parking lots and garages. And if you look in Kakaako, you know, you drive around, there's new condominiums going up, which is great. Uh, but then there's a huge parking garage right next to it to appease all the cars and all the people. And it's... It's basically the same amount of land used for the parking as it is for the condominium. So do we really want to use our precious land to house cars instead of housing people? I mean, I hope not. Um, and we really need to start designing for people, not for cities, which is mentioned, I think, earlier by Lee and Mike, which is great. Um, so as an example of that is New York City. And this is, I think, you know, a typical view of New York City that we all have in our mind, busy, congested, lots of cars. This is Times Square. Uh, one of the busiest, I think, areas in the, in the world. And this is what they recently done with Times Square. This is designing for people, not for cars. They took out four lanes of traffic, and it ended up being safer, uh, minimal impact to traffic, healthier, and increased walking and cycling. So this is a great example of a designing for people and not for cities and taking that plunge in one of the busiest intersections in the world. And this is Honolulu. This is the ball bouts that are in Chinatown. They haven't even been there for two months, and they're already getting significant pushback. Um, and these were put in to enhance walking and pedestrian and increase safety uh, you know, through, throughout their community, which is a great opportunity for us to really take advantage of. But unfortunately, you know, it's receiving pushback, and it has raised some controversy. Um, so you know, moving forward, I think we really need to think not about the future, I mean, not about us, but about the future. You know, the survey is great, but we're not designing for us. We're designing for our kids, for the next generation. And so we need the full support of everyone in this room, particularly at the county level. I mean, the county departments are here, which are great. They're making great progress, but we need the mayors aligned, and we really need the city councils aligned to really move things forward with projects like this and with others so we can all provide a, a better environment for not only us, but for our future and for our kids. So, you know, as Ulupono, we're eager and happy to collaborate and help with folks uh, across the industry. We were initial funders of Bike Share. We recently funded a public-private partnership study for rail. 
So we look forward to continuing the conversations with everyone in this panel, everyone in the room, to really you know, create an aligned vision for a clean transportation future that gets people out of cars and really provides a healthier, safer environment for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. And I was in New York recently, and uh, I noticed that not only was this happening in Times Square, it was happening on 6th Avenue. Imagine a mile on 6th Avenue, all people, no traffic at all. And I thought, does this ever happen, really happen, where people can spill into public places and enjoy our public spaces here in Honolulu? Ford, we've got to do something. They're county roads. <laughs> it's the county, right, it's the county. Hear that, Mike? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, now the part I like, where you get to examine the speakers. Well, we've been, we've been getting questions during the session, so we're going to see some of the questions we have. So let's see. We're going to have first, we're going to have some questions. Where are the questions? I know there are questions there. They're coming. Watch this. Okay, questions for the panel, submitted by you guys. Let's see what we got. No, it's coming, it's coming. Lauren, patience. <laughs> this is technology. I'm going to let my uncle, as opposed to my nephew, Carl Friedman, pose these questions to you directly. This is just for memory from something that somebody promoted up. But how is the city and county uh, measuring the uh, impact of its uh, clean streets, smart streets, clean streets program? Uh, complete, 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 complete streets. Street streets. That was the uh, term of the day that they used when they created my position. So. I got to promote it as much as I can so I don't become uh, obsolete. Um, as part of the 2013 implementation study that we did, um, we actually had a performance measures piece of that study which, which talked about all the necessary um, data collection that is required to be able to point towards these types of improvement. And it is something that we are working on. We have a data collection program. Um, when we implemented the King Street pilot project, we, we continued the data collection with that to show the um, increase in bicycle traffic and rather negligible um, increase in delay of vehicles. And so that's the type of program that we are still establishing. It's not something that we have fully pulled together quite yet, um, but our, our planning department of DTS is actually um, moving forward on those types of efforts so that we can have a, a performance measures type of system to be able to show the benefits of, of what we're doing and, and really point towards that as we do additional improvements. Thank you. Okay, let's go to our the questions we now have. Um, is the concept, there's a silent T there, is the concept of car-free cities important? Well, is it doable? Uh, could that happen in Hawaii? Could that ever happen? People love cars in Hawaii. Could we ever, ever achieve that? Not in 20 or 2045 or 2050, but ever could we ever achieve that? Anybody want to talk about that? Uh, I'll provide some input. I mean, you think you love cars here, you should go to Texas. Um, but th that aside, I don't think eliminating vehicles altogether is a reality, um, at least you know, not for a good chunk of the population. But you think of co certain pockets, like urban Honolulu, um, you know, maybe other areas, 
where you can eliminate a significant amount of the car trips. Um, and that's, you know, again, through providing a number of alternative options, providing the infrastructure, making it safer, um, and increasing the perception, increasing the, uh, you know, public transit options and things like that, making it more convenient and easier, uh, will significantly reduce the number of car ve vehicles and vehicle miles traveled and, you know, the oil that we consume and import here in the state. So I think there is a great opportunity, but I, in my opinion, I don't think it's realistic to completely eliminate cars. Um, but we can do much, much better than we are doing now. Yeah. Well, you know, what about uh, you know, what they do in Bermuda? You know, no cars, no cars. And I suppose, um, you know, in this country, we have legal issues around that, about no cars. But could we ever create, and uh, Dave Rolfe might have comments about this, could we, could we ever <laughs> create a limit on the number of cars, like a limit, there's a limit in New York City on the number of taxi cabs that get those shields, you know, you can only have so many. Could we ever say, look, we, we, are, we are going to limit it to X units and that's it? Could we do that? Would you recommend that? Do you think that would be helpful and would it work? Uh, I mean, I'll probably say something that's not very popular, but uh, some mechanisms do that. I mean, you can do it through taxes, right? So if you start, you know, uh, increasing or adjusting you know taxes on vehicles and you know ideally using some of that funds to invest in the infrastructure and the alternatives i think you can start to really sway people you know away from from buying cars or owning cars i mean i used to live in singapore and their a tax on a vehicle is literally like 400 percent so a twenty thousand dollar car is a hundred thousand dollars um and guess what not a lot of people own cars um, a lot of people take public transit, rail, bus, walk, bike, um, and so there are mechanisms in place, but I mean, you know, politically challenging. Hmm, thank you. Anybody else on this question? Mike? I wanted to touch on since I was, I'll give you the mic for uh, I wouldn't say that our goal is to remove all cars from the streets, and I think that's a misconception of complete streets. We, we are not anti-car. I myself drive a car, boo. But the reality is that uh, we need to be equitable in how we provide for, for all people. And Greg completely touched on it when he talked about upwards of $10,000 a year to own and operate a vehicle. When cost of living in Hawaii is so expensive, who are we really providing for when we continue to do infrastructure that helps support vehicles and, and transporting that way? when there's such a large part of our population that can't afford to own vehicles and really rely upon walking, um, bicycling, and using bus systems. These are the people who we should be looking to help and assist, not those that can already afford to, to own and operate vehicles. So just to add to both of those, I want to say on Kauai that we, we're not making any effort to prohibit cars. We're really looking at this as an issue of choice, that giving people uh, the opportunity to take other modes of transportation should they choose. And kind of based on something that you said, Greg, was um, in terms of as, of, as also looking at incentives that can encourage other uses. So for example, through employers to have bulk rate bus programs that makes it super affordable for people to, um, to ride the bus. Or at Kauai Community College, every student as part of their fees gets a bus pass which then just encourages the use of the bus in a very inexpensive way. And just to follow up on something Mike mentioned, one of the metrics that we use is housing plus transportation cost. And looking at can we reduce that because of the cost of car ownership is so expensive, can we track what that is in the state of Hawaii and in the county of Kauai to see through these alternatives and through these choices, are we actually reducing every, the family and per capita cost of housing plus transportation? Okay, we've got to move on. Uh, we're behind schedule. So let's go to the audience poll. Um, and we'll have more discussion on these very questions than questions we couldn't have, we didn't have the time to pose to you in our, in our follow-up shows. Okay, audience poll. And now we have a couple of questions for you. The audience, we have the questions on the sheet you got uh, with your program. I'm talking to the audience now. Note, note that the questions are longer than what you see on the screen. Okay. Um, it's the limited characters of meeting sift. So we're gonna read, read the questions, okay? How are we doing in our progress toward clean transportation? So please answer that. Okay. 
Okay? We're, <laughs> we're, the chances are we're doing great. We're being held back by, by, back by lack of funding or political will. Uh, we need to rethink our current goals and uh, strategies, or it's hopeless. Okay, well, at least we don't have a lot of hopeless there anyway. <laughs> All right, good. That gives us a handle. Uh, let's go to the, the next uh, question. This is called Rank the Top Three Actions to Achieve uh, uh, Clean Transportation. The answers are significant, A, significantly increase gas tax, B, provide better road maintenance and improvements for ve vehicular travel, C, expand and improve bus transportation, D, provide additional mass transit options like rail, ferry, um, E, provide more bike lanes and bike road, bike, bike road improvements, F, provide safe infrastructure for pedestrians, uh, G, increase availability of alternative fuels, H, increase availability of, uh, of charging stations, and I, uh, change land use planning and strategies as they affect transportation. Ho ho, see where you guys are at. Oh wow, this will be published. <laughs> Very good. Very good, good for you. Okay, next, next one. Um, Oh, I guess, is this another question? Do we miss any strategies? Yeah, do we miss any strategies? So if there are other strategies you didn't see on that previous list, this is a chance for you to articulate those strategies that uh, we and the agencies involved might consider. Anybody have anything? I guess we covered that all in the, in the list we gave. Oh, there's some. Okay, okay, no, okay. It's a word map. Parking. <laughs> Sharing. Increase car fees. We'll publish this too. <laughs> Keep them coming. Oh, driverless, I saw that. There's a lot there. Okay. I might mention that all those Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's a word map and it's always interesting to watch a word map, especially when the word map develops in front of your eyes. But when we publish our report, we will give you the the actual suggestions that are being received in response to this question. Okay? So you'll see them all. So stand by for that report. Okay, now we're gonna to move to our featured speaker, uh, Councillor Craig Dirksen, uh, Oregon Metro Council. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, thank you for your <laughs> remarks and your answers. Okay, this is a, a moment to take a look at the big picture. Um, what is happening in other places around the country? After all, we're not the only place grappling with these transportation issues and how to pay for the solutions. So we went and sought out other models in other places that have uh, working energy efficient transportation systems. And Craig Dirksen is a member of the Oregon Metro Council. We wanna learn more about his background. If, if you wanna learn more about his background and commitment to clean uh, transportation and his leadership in moving Portland from vision to reality, um, he will speak on the Portland story in integrating transportation and land use to advance energy efficiency. That's the title of his remarks. So a welcome, a warm welcome to Hawaii and to Clean Energy Day for Craig Dirksen. Thanks for being here, Craig. Mahalo and aloha. How much time have I got? I suspect I've got a hard stop when the governor arrives. Are uh, you? Okay, well, I won't pause and I'll move on. Uh, as was said, I am Craig Dirksen I'm with the Metro Council. And- uh, um, 20 minutes, okay? 20 minutes, thank you. Uh, my wife and I really love Hawaii. It's where we come on vacation usually. And we've been here, I think I've been here 15 times, uh, uh, primarily to uh, Oahu, 
uh, and to Maui. We really like Lahaina Town and, uh, and Hanukawai, which is an area north of there. Uh, but uh, uh, so what's Metro and, and who's this guy from the mainland not wearing an Aloha shirt uh, uh, coming to talk to us? Uh, what, what's, why is he here? Well, the, and I have a picture of, this is a picture of, of downtown Portland. And uh, we also have a live volcano uh, in our state, which is uh, Mount Hood right there. It hasn't erupted for about 200 years, but it still steams from time to time. And only about uh, 40 miles north of that is Mount St. Helens, which everybody knows about, which uh, actually dumped a bunch of ash on my house back in 1980. And then it rained and it all washed down into my gutters and ripped the ring gutters off of my house along with all of my neighbors. Uh, so we do have some similarities uh, with, with Hawaii, but a lot of differences as well. Uh, here's another picture of Portland with the, the Willamette River, which runs through the middle of Portland. Uh, the bridge in the foreground is the Tillicum Crossing. Tillicum is the Native American word for the people. So it's the people's crossing. Uh, this was a bridge that was built when we built uh, the, the most recent light rail line, the orange line that runs from downtown Portland over to the suburb of Milwaukee. And this bridge is, is unusual in that uh, it serves transit. It has a light rail line on it, also buses, also bike and ped, but there's, uh, it doesn't connect to any streets, so there's no, no, no private cars run on this bridge at all. Um, so the, the Metro Council, the Metro is the regional government for the Portland metropolitan area, which is 24 cities, one of which is Portland, but uh, 23 others as well, and I actually live in the city of Tigard, which is a suburb of Portland, and I was the mayor there before I was on the Metro Council. And the Metro Council is uh, six elected officials. They're elected by districts, and also a, uh, a, uh, a president, council president, that's elected at large. And uh, we have uh, several responsibilities. Uh, we are the, uh, Metro is the federally designated MPO for the Portland metropolitan area, but we also have several other responsibilities, not only land use and transportation planning, but we are also the regional uh, 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 solid waste. We're responsible for collection and disposal of solid waste. Uh, we also have about 17,000 acres of parks and open space that we're responsible for, and also several visitor venues, including the Oregon Zoo and the uh, Convention Center, Expo Center, five performing arts centers, all those kinds of things. Uh, we are the only MPO in the United States that is directly elected by the people. And as elected officials, that means we also have uh, a taxing authority, and that, is the, that authority is what we use to raise money to do all of the other things that we do as well. Our charter is from the state of Oregon, and they've given us several responsibilities, and it's pretty open-ended. It basically says any issue of regional concern we can take on, and so we've taken on a lot of those things. And all of the things that we do with the goal of meeting one of the six desired outcomes, which is in this fan, you see the four areas of responsibility and out at the end is uh, on the outside is the things we want to achieve clean air and water transportation choices vibrant communities uh, healthy ecosystem economic prosperity and equity so some ways that we are different has to do and i know the interesting with this group is about power generation um, this is a picture of uh, the Columbia River Gorge with the Columbia River running through it, and that is Bonifield Dam, which was built in the 1930s, and it generates about 1,100 megawatts of electricity. And it's only one of a dozen dams on the, uh, the Columbia River and on the other rivers around uh, Oregon that, uh, that we use to generate power. And we also, east of the uh, Cascade Mountains, if you know Oregon, the, the western half is very green and lush in the west in the eastern half on the other side of the mountains is mostly desert and we have millions of acres of, of uh, arid land out there where we we can uh, uh, put a lot of windmills up and generate electricity that way as well i know you have some of that in uh, in hawaii but that is limited because of your size and space so there's uh, uh, it's hard to compare Portland and Hawaii because they're so different. Hawaii, especially unique location, also uh, limited options for things that, that you can't do the things that we do. Uh, a lot of our power generation is already 
green, our largest energy generation is from renewable hydro, hydropower, from dams, and from wind. We also generate electricity from natural gas. We don't have any uh, oil in Oregon, but we do have natural gas fields, which is still a fossil fuel, but it's a lot cleaner than, than oil and other, other fossil fuels. And we also, believe it or not, a lot of the electricity that we use in Portland comes from coal, less than half, but, but there's some that comes from coal. But because we're connected to the national power grid in the continental United States, the coal is, is uh, mined and, and the, the power is generated in Colorado, a thousand miles away. We, we just get the electricity, we don't get the smoke. So we have that opportunity as well. So here's the Portland metro area. Uh, some, just some facts about uh, Portland. Portland is uh, about 1.6 million people. We have about 800,000 jobs. Uh, it's about 50% more people than you have, but the area is about the same size as uh, Oahu. Um, so, and we are growing really fast. We're like the 15th largest, fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States. We're growing between one and one and a half percent a year. And we have been for the last 50 years, uh, good economy and bad. And that equates right now with that we're seeing an increase of about 111 people per day to the Portland metro area. And that means about 33 families and about 50 more cars on the road every day in Portland that we're trying to deal with. Um, Portland is the engine for, the, for Oregon's economy. Uh, it's home to about half of uh, Portland's jobs. The three counties that make up the Portland metropolitan area out of 39 in Oregon, it, we have about 45% of the people and we generate about 55% of the income tax revenue for the state. Uh, but congestion, along with a good economy, comes a lot of activity and that turns into traffic congestion. And the congestion in the area is, has significant impacts on our economic health. So you'd probably know that Portland has a reputation of being a leader on transportation planning and sustainability, uh, which I'll talk about, but we have our challenges too. Uh, Portland is a mix of urban and suburban communities with different priorities and when it comes to transportation and land use. And there's tension between advocacy for biking, walking, transit, and demands on, for maintenance and road construction as well. Uh, it can be challenging to achieve a consensus on a regional transportation priority when you have so many different people living in so many different living situations throughout the region. Urban, suburban, exurban. Uh, other challenges increase, uh, include increasing transportation needs in all the categories, whether you're talking about transit or road capacity or bike and ped, all those different things. Plus, we have uh, limited and declining state and federal funding for transportation. So Oregon doesn't have as many transportation funding sources as many other states do. We have no sales tax in Oregon, which I know a lot of states use to fund transportation. We have no uh, uh, value-added tax. Plus, we have a constitutional amendment in the Oregon Constitution that only allows uh, vehicle-related taxes like gas taxes and uh, uh, vehicle registration fees and whatnot can only be spent on roads, cannot even be spent on other kinds of transportation, and can't be spent on anything else. So it comes to a real challenge, becomes a real challenge when we try to find ways to fund other things than roads. So how did we get where we are now? Uh, back in the 1960s, we were like every other city in the United States. We were in a freeway building frenzy. And uh, so this is a map of what the, the, trans the, the freeway plan was for the Portland area in the 1960s. The red ones that you see there are actually the freeways that we have. All those other green ones were planned as well. Uh, but concerns about sprawl in the late 70s served as an impetus for the state of Oregon to establish land use planning framework um, that mandated development of both local comprehensive plans in accordance with state guidelines, and it established urban growth boundaries around each city in the state of Oregon. So every state in Oregon has a line drawn around it, and it says you cannot build urban development outside that line. And each city has a council that is responsible for administering that line and de determining if and when and where it should move to accommodate future development. And the Metro Council is, we administer the UGB 
for the Portland metropolitan area. Um, also, th this gives us uh, uh, protection for farms and forest land around Portland. Uh, it gives us standards for urbanization. There are 19 state land use planning goals that we're required to adhere to. It requires a transparent planning process and public engagement and public involvement at every level of planning. Uh, so Metro works closely with our local jurisdictions to manage growth and accommodate their aspirations for development. Does that look familiar? This shows the edge of our urban growth boundary. On one side, development is allowed. On the other side, not. So uh, when the urban growth boundary was formed, it was uh, about 234,000 acres. Um, and the base case scenario for continued expansion would have added about 121,000 more acres over 50 years. But so far, we've only added about 30,000. Uh, so how do you deal with growth when you have limited ability to expand out for new development? Uh, the metro area created the 2040 growth concept, which reflects the values of access to nature, protecting habitats, safe and stable neighborhoods, transportation choices, preserving quality of life for future generations, foster a vibrant economy and culture. And employment areas are designated uh, it focuses investment and concentrates growth in identified centers and corridors and station areas called transit-oriented development. It also protects natural areas and increases access to nature in the urban and suburban communities. When you uh, increase density in your urban area, protecting open space for people to enjoy becomes more and more important as the area becomes more densified and more urbanized. Uh, another thing that we've recognized that we need to do is you need to provide people with more options for transportation. You don't limit them, take them away. Uh, we're never going to be I, in question that was made earlier. I don't see a time in the future when we'll ever be able to go away with, with uh, cars, ground transportation. But the, uh, the problem is, is when you design your city so people have no other choice but to do that. So you need to provide people with other options, better options, and they will choose them when it works well for them. So um, establishing efl efficient land use uh, patterns helps facilitate effective and efficient transportation planning. Uh, we've had over 30 years of designing and building a high capacity transit network. This is our light rail network. Uh, the ones that are solid lines exist today and the dotted lines are ones that are under uh, development right now, under planning right now. Um, it requires regional and local leadership and adopting, adoption of shared priorities. Each part of the region has gotten or is anticipated to receive its high capacity transit investment. A transit provider, which is TriMet, not us, there's a separate agency with its own appointed board that actually is in, in charge of transit in Portland, but we work in very close uh, partnership with them. Uh, the transit provider is also focused on identifying opportunities for ongoing transit improvements in buses as well for local. We find a big challenge with what we call the last mile. How do you get people from the high capacity transit line to their home? That's, the, that's the, uh, uh, oftentimes the tough, uh, tough shot. Um, and we need money from the legislature for low income fares and also for increased service. Another picture of Portland. Um, so there's a strong connection between land use and transportation in our regional planning, and it yields multiple benefits. I want to reiterate that you really can't think of one without the other, land use planning and transportation planning, because your transportation planning must support the community's vision for land use. Uh, it will help reduce congestion. It provides a better jobs housing balance so that people can choose to live close to where they work so that they don't have to commute as far to their jobs. That equates to more efficient energy use, and it provides opportunities to look at the cost of living more holistically, looking at both housing and transportation combined. The old story is you keep moving farther away from the center until you can afford the house. But then your transportation costs have gone up, so you really don't save any money in the end. So we've had the 2040 plan in place since about 1995. So the question is, 
How is it doing? Is it working? In 2009, the state legislature required us to, uh, they gave us a mandate to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the Portland metro area from, uh, uh, from cars and light trucks by 20% by 2035. And they required us to come up with a plan and submit it to the state. Thank you. They would show us how to do that. And as you can see from this slide, uh, what we found out was that our adopted plans, the 2040 plan, would actually reduce it 24% if we're able to implement it, if we can afford to implement it with the level of investments we have. But because of the level of investment we have, we would only be able to do 12%. 12 so we worked through and created a new plan that would actually reduce it. In the end, our climate smart strategy that we submitted to the state will reduce uh, by 29%. So just doing what we were already doing before they gave us the mandate, we actually will be able to achieve that given the ability to invest in the things we need to invest in. I want to uh, reiterate in my last few seconds that it's very important when you're going through these things to um, involve the community. And, and uh, we're required to by the state, but you need to do it. You need to bring in advocates from your community for biking and, and hiking and uh, people that think you should only use cars and people who are supportive of transit and involve them in your decision making and planning so that when you come up with a plan like the, the light rail system uh, plan, that it's something that the community feels like they were part of that and they own it and, it, and it's, okay. it's their plan. It isn't something that was imposed. I really appreciate what uh, Lee Steinmet said about what's going on in, on Kauai and I want to say keep doing that because that's exactly the kind of thing that we've discovered that works. So I will skip ahead because I'm out of time. Oh, I wanted to show you, these are the things that we found would do the most to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which equates immediately or directly to energy use. Transit does the most. Judicious use of parking, either by providing it or not providing it. Uh, improving active transportation and better transportation information. These were the, the plans that we brought together to create the Southwest Corridor Plan, which is the last light rail line that's, that hasn't been built yet. Unfortunately, that's the one that goes from downtown Portland to the town I live in. Here's a, a picture of one of our, our charrette uh, meetings where we brought uh, leaders in, uh, both community leaders and elected leaders, appointed uh, people from around the state to talk about how we move forward and get these things done. Oh, I should have had one more. Should be one more slide, sorry. I would like to leave you with these points. As you can see, our region, just like yours, is not without challenges standing in the way of progress toward a complete transportation system and energy efficiency. Some are similar to your situation, some are different. My hope is that the things I've shared with you today and will share throughout the next two days, uh, you can glean from and be able to adapt to your own unique circumstances. I'd like to leave you with these points. Ensure that communities' visions for land use drives your transportation planning and investments. Advocating for complete transportation systems that work for all users, including people who want to drive their car. And building that shared vision through inclusive public engagement and ongoing collaboration with partners. Thank you. Thank you, Craig Dirksen. Craig is going to be available in our mini charrette later in the afternoon for further conversation on these points. We can learn a lot from what's happened in Portland. And now, the man at the top, Governor David Ige. He's going to tell about the state of clean energy in our state of clean energy and what he and his administration have done to move us closer to 100% clean energy and the opportunities and challenges that, we need, that would lie ahead for clean energy and clean transportation in Hawaii. A very warm welcome for Governor David Ige. Aloha. Uh, thank you once again for inviting me to be part of your uh, Clean Energy Day Conference, the ninth annual. Uh, 
each year gets better and better. So I just wanted to start by thanking the, the, all the sponsors uh, and the participants that have been supporting uh, this forum. It really is a great way to get uh, people, um, all the stakeholders involved with uh, energy uh, to talk story and explore progress uh, and then most importantly, uh, plan next steps. I'm glad to see I was reviewing the uh, conference agenda and I know that Ford Fuchigami uh, had uh, participated uh, in an earlier panel today. As you know, I did ask Ford to begin the conversation about clean energy and transportation and I think he's done a terrific job of getting all the stakeholders together. Most importantly, how many of you live on the windward side, right? I mean, Kahekili Highway Contraflow uh, you know, was kind of one of those ideas that we thought would help and uh, implemented in record time and uh, my understanding is it's been going great so far. Um, we uh, know that our environment is so much a part of everything that is Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is about the people, place and culture uh, and the place part of that is uh, so important to our ability uh, to generate so much of what's important in our economy. Climate change is real. Um, we are already feeling it. We've seen the king tides and other manifestations. Uh, we do know that sea level rise is occurring uh, and we need to take action. Uh, I'm so proud to be governor of the state of Hawaii. Uh, our community understands why climate change uh, is an important issue and I think most importantly uh, we in Hawaii have been willing to step forward and lead the country and the world uh, in our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, and improve carbon capture to make our, our environment a much better place. Just wanted to applaud all of your work uh, this past session as you know I once again uh, we continue to make progress in a clean energy future. Um, I was proud to sign um, the first measure uh, in the country uh, committing to the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, again, <laughs> you know, I, once again, uh, the country and the world looks to Hawaii in our, commu uh, our commitment to a clean clean energy future. Uh, and we do know uh, that part, uh, another part of the legislation that we um, passed, um, well, did two things, right? One was really reorganized, I think, uh, um, a little bit, the commission that will be looking at uh, climate change and, and global warming, uh, and thinking uh, more, uh, I think, a little more aggressively about the policy changes uh, that we need to make uh, to, to um, better implement uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. I think the other part of that bill also looks at uh, carbon capture uh, and how we can um, look to become part of that carbon economy, look at how Hawaii can play a role uh, in as the world starts looking at um, the issue and starts thinking about how to align much more of the economic activity with the environmental uh, objectives, how Hawaii might be better positioned to be able to participate in that. And as you know, Act 33 was the Carbon Farming Task Force, uh, our commitment to look at um, how we can improve soil health and promote carbon sequestration in the state's uh, agri agriculture and aquaculture sectors you know, we do know that that's an opportunity that allows us to accelerate our move to a uh, clean energy future. Um, we know uh, that the greatest uh, energy savings in residential uh, electricity sector will come from reducing demand, uh, increasing, uh, well, in reducing demand increasing comfort and natural ventilation, eliminating uh, electric water heaters. Um, and that's why I've also approved the update uh, to the International Energy Conservation Code for the construction industry, 
construction of state buildings because I always believe that leading by example is a good thing. You know, this paves the way for adoption of the code by counties, eventually requiring all new commercial and residential construction uh, to meet code. You know, we estimate that the payback period for homes built to the new code uh, is estimated at 4.3 years. Uh, we believe that it would save 1.4 billion in energy costs over the next 20 years, so a significant savings for our community. The updated code would reduce energy use by almost one third and make a significant contribution toward achieving Hawaii's clean energy goals. Uh, additionally, the Hawaii energy aggressive Hawaii Energy is aggressively promoting rebates and increasing adoption of energy efficiency initiatives, uh, delivering another 1.2 million kilowatts of savings over the lifetime of the equipment. You know, state government, again, is leading by example by improving our commitment to energy efficiency in state facilities. Ford, and I know he talked earlier, although I I know he was focused on transportation, uh, has truly been a leader in energy savings performance contracts for highways and harbors, uh, saving more than 776 million of your tax dollars uh, to really operate um, those transportation facilities that Ford oversees, airports and harbors. Uh, and again, Hawaii leads the nation in energy savings contracts. You know, really, it is about leading by example and making sure that the state is committed uh, to do its part to reduce energy consumption. So let's talk about transportation. And I know that your conference here is really focused on what we can do uh, to d reduce fossil fuel uh, in the transportation sector. Uh, Hawaii has aggressively pursued alternative fuels. We probably had um, a tax credit for, um, for biofuels on our books forever, although no one ever took us up on it. Uh, but we did uh, pass recently uh, a new initiative uh, to provide um, tax credits for uh, biodiesel production. Uh, we know that um, we need to pursue the clean energy uh, alternatives because it is such an important part of a 100% clean energy. And I don't know if we'll ever get to 100% in clean energy for transportation purposes. But clearly, uh, the goal and objective in moving forward is, is very important. You know, biodiesel, hydrogen, uh, electricity, clean natural gas are important parts of that. Uh, the state is working with uh, numerous stakeholders, uh, academic institutions, federal agencies, uh, and private sector companies in moving this forward. Uh, earlier this month, um, Servco broke ground on a hydrogen fueling station, uh, the first in Hawaii, which is expected to be completed uh, early next year. You know, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles is truly a zero emission zero compromise uh, solution. Uh, the cars are fun to drive and good to look at. Uh, most importantly, uh, the only emissions uh, is water. Um, and the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle most closely uh, mimics the operation of the fossil fuel-based vehicles today. You can fill up uh, whenever you need to uh, in three to five minutes. Uh, and more and more automakers are looking at uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as an alternative uh, to the fossil fuel vehicles, and it truly is a zero emission uh, vehicle of the future. Uh, electric vehicles, again, is another option uh, for a renewable energy uh, future, uh, dra drastically reducing carbon pollution uh, compared to a fossil fuel vehicle. Uh, and we also believe that it can help to lower energy costs for everyone 
uh, if we can fully integrate uh, electric vehicles into the entire energy ecosystem if, of our community. You know, this year registered 5,000 electric vehicles, um, but we need to do more to get uh, electric vehicles more readily deployed in our community. Um, I do support replacing the state's aging fleet uh, with zero emission vehicles and certainly encouraging as the state is looking at acquiring vehicles or replacing vehicles in our fleet that we look to uh, zero, zero emission vehicles uh, as a priority. Uh, we, have also, we also have the opportunity to support electric, electrification of Hawaii's transportation sector uh, with funds from settlement claims against Volkswagen for their fudging some of the statistics uh, and information provided uh, to the federal regulators. Um, you know, Hawaii's allocation of that settlement fund uh, is $8.1 million. Um, up to 15% will be eligible to be spent on light duty, zero emission vehicle supply, uh, supply equipment. So that's uh, electric vehicle charging stations and other kinds of infrastructure. In addition, uh, DBID's Clean Energy Initiative Transportation Energy Analysis Report, uh, published in 2015, identified 22 recommendations that could potentially provide a reduction of 72 million gallons per year of fossil fuel consumption by the year 2030. The Department of Transportation Sustainable Transportation Forum includes stakeholders from all uh, various sectors uh, involved with transportation. They are working on technical issues and opportunities to ensure the environment and social and economic considerations are all factored into decisions affecting transportation guidelines in the future. Drive Electric Hawaii brings public and private entities together to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles here in Hawaii uh, together, making it easier to expand vehicle charging infrastructure and helping to bring more renewable energy uh, into the electric grid. So we're making progress toward green transportation. Um, we have much, much more to do. I know that the legislature took up the whole issue of es establishing uh, targets and guidelines uh, that will drive our electrification of transportation. And I think that that uh, conversation should continue. You know, f the path forward that I see uh, covers a couple things. First, um, we need to uh, find a, um, a goal uh, that is designed and enacted to adequately align uh, the actions of all of us. You know, having uh, engagement uh, of the community, especially in this area where up until recent history, transportation really has been a private activity. Uh, most of us uh, are driving in uh, individual cars um, uh, with large numbers taking uh, the bus system, uh, but for the most part, um, most of us riding in individual autos. Um, so second, the bill would need uh, the support of public government agencies, utilities, community agencies, the, the more structured and government side of the equation, as we need to ensure that our infrastructure can um, facilitate and ease the transformation to, uh, e to clean energy transportation. Uh, and third, a variety of partnerships uh, would have to be involved in implementation of the public, private, and nonprofit sectors that would allow us to facilitate and accelerate um, the greening of our transportation system. Uh, we believe that we need to bring together all stakeholders uh, together uh, to, to have dialogue and engage in talking about a clean energy transportation future. Um, uh, next month, we'll be sharing the results uh, and plans um, for the future 
at Climate Week and Climate Alliance uh, in New York. As you know, the state of Hawaii uh, has, has chosen to join the Climate Alliance, uh, recognizing that re uh, sub-regional and regional uh, collections of communities committed to a clean energy future uh, can make a statement and can exert leadership that allows us to move forward. Um, I will be sharing, as part of those activities, the lessons that we've learned from Hokulea, that we are one canoe, one island, one planet. What happens in Hawaii impacts uh, communities around the world, and most importantly, what happens in communities around the world uh, impacts us here in Hawaii. Uh, we can act for change now. We must continue to exert our leadership uh, to create a better future, especially as it relates to clean energy. So mahalo and aloha, thank you for being here. I know. I know that when I come to this event, I really am preaching to the choir. I know that many of you have been at the forefront of advocating uh, for a clean energy future in so many different ways. And I just want to thank you all for your part and participation in all of the efforts that allows Hawaii to continue to lead the world uh, in regards to a clean energy future. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you, Governor, uh, and thank you for your support for clean energy and, and for the forum and the work that we all do together. Um, and, and for joining us in the annual Transformational Achievement Award uh, ceremony that we have here, recognizing those who you talk about who make a difference uh, in, in that making that vision a reality. These are our real heroes in establishing the policies, designing and testing the technologies, partnering to solve the problems and meeting the challenges, and reaching out to the public. Uh, the, our co-chairs, Mike Hamnett and myself, uh, this is the best part of our program, of course, where we recognize six organizations and individuals who have made transformational achievements in advancing clean energy. This is the third year we're making these awards, and thank you, Governor, for being here for all of those. Um, and because there's so much that we achieve to, to reach these goals, uh, we don't take the time to step back and celebrate what we've done. You've heard a number of the achievements already this morning, and what these people do are the same as what we all try to do, and we are recognizing six of them who represent you. And this is why the forum wants to celebrate and take time out, pause, and honor those who are in the field. We reviewed 16 nominations this year. Our members vetted them carefully and selected six who met our criteria in one, addressing an issue or need to advance Hawaii's clean energy future, two, finding and implementing solutions that no one else, no one else has, and three, continuing to build on their work so that it doesn't stop with that project but actually is moving forward and building on the work that they've done. We know, as Governor said, that all eyes are in Hawaii and our ambitious clean energy goals. So we do need to acknowledge the pioneers who have stepped out, taken the risk, and moved us closer to where we want to go. We applaud these organizations and individuals who are models to others, paving the way, leading Hawaii and the world. We also acknowledge their collaborators and supporting partners because we know that efforts as big as these require many people working well together. And Mike, you wanna go into our awards? Thanks, Sharon. Um, Again, this year's award is once again created by our very talented forum member, member General Stan Osterman. Uh, the, uh, the awards themselves are, are really a work of art. And you can see on the screen the, the love and talent that went into uh, creating these, these very beautiful awards. 
they are works of art and symbolic of the significance of the transformational achievements that the people receiving the award have made. The globe on the locally grown wood symbolizes leadership, teamwork, as a model not only for others in Hawaii, but for the world. These organizations and individuals dared to put paddles in the water and to move us, and to move us forward as examples to the rest of the world. A big mahalo to Stan, uh, General Stan Osterman for helping us create the award. <laughs> Thanks, Stan. Sh Sharon and I will call each awardee and tell you why the forum sees their work and achievements as transformational. You can see the fuller descriptions of their work in your program. Uh, we also ask them to share with us briefly in a minute uh, what's next as, uh, in terms of the things they're doing to build on the achievements to advance clean energy future for Hawaii. So let's begin. Sharon, bring up our first awardee. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, the Collaborative Problem Solving Award goes to Biki, Hawaii for collaboratively creating energy-saving mobility. <laughs> bringing, bringing together partners who made a vision of bike share become a reality. They brought zero fossil fuel personal mobility to the people of Honolulu. You see the blue bikes all around Honolulu, bikes that weren't there before Biki launched its program on June 28th of this year. It was a long process that began in 2012 with many stakeholders in the Bike Share Working Group, getting city funding for planning and finally securing partners to create the nonprofit that provides carbon neutral and healthy transportation. We, con we congratulate Biki Hawaii and call, oh, he's already here, <laughs> President Greg Gock to accept the award. Greg, um, would you like to come here and give us one minute of what you're gonna do next? Uh, first, thank you very much uh, for the award, for the recognition um, from the foreign, from the governor. Uh, we're very excited to, uh, to uh, be recognized for this. It's been a, a long work in progress, as Sharon mentioned. Is, you know, want to thank the state, the city, the working group. Um, it's really a collaborative effort, or a true you know, public-private partnership to get this thing off, off the ground. Uh, and we're excited to you know, take it from here and really you know, start to optimize the system and start to expand the system. Uh, right now, it's in urban Honolulu, but we're already looking at, you know, how can we uh, serve some of the uh, neighboring areas uh, to so we can expand and better, you know, provide the service for them. In addition to uh, other pockets throughout the island, and hopefully eventually throughout the state, to get it on some of the neighbor islands as well to give people a safe, healthy alternative to driving the vehicle. So, thank you very much. Uh, we're truly honored, um, and look forward to you know seeing where this goes from here. Um, we're going to have one picture and then we're going to move on and we're going to have time after governor's going to stay with us so uh, the collaborators can come and take pictures with us outside on the steps after um, all of the uh, awards are presented Yeah, the Energy Conservation and Efficiency Award goes to the State Building Code Council for updating the State Energy Code, uh, Energy Conservation Code. It was no easy task for any, any of you that have worked in the building standards business. You know it's a very contentious uh, effort. It was no easy task, and the building code has not been revised since 2006, so it was a tireless effort of a partnership among State Energy Office, the Hawaii Energy... Uh, State Energy Office in Hawaii and the State Building Code Council was able to recommend the new 2016 Building Energy Code for the governor's signature. When fully implemented by the counties, the code is expected to increase energy efficiency savings, as the governor mentioned, by about 30 percent. In Hawaii's tropical pathways enable housing to, um, housing to be more comfortable and affordable. 
accepting the award on behalf of the Building Code Council is Howard Wig, Chair of the Council Investigative Committee. Howard, you want to come up here and give us a give us a minute on where things are going from here. Thank you, Governor, for signing. In so signing, you took Hawaii from this beat up, battered old thing to this brand spanking new energy code. We went from being one of the worst in the nation to being one of the first in the nation. Plus, we amended this mainland code to suit Hawaii's climate. And as a result, we're going to achieve savings of up to 33%. And in some cases, we're going to lower the cost of construction. And as was introduced, we will be saving by the magic year 2045, way, way, way over a billion dollars. And this is going to be a major step toward achieving 100% clean energy by 2045. So thank you again. Senator, oh, okay. Where is, is that mine? No, this, this is mine. Where's my? Okay. Uh, the Energy Policy and Legislation Award goes to the Hawaii State Legislature and Senator Kalani English. Could you come forward, please, Senator? Oh, the wrong way again. And this is for committing the state to climate change mitigation and adaptation, anticipating President Trump's withdrawal from the 2015 Paris Agreement on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving climate change resilience. Senator English introduced Senate Bill 559, which was signed by Governor Ige into law as Act 32. But Act 32 did more. It expanded the strategies and mechanisms for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It established a Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, and it provided a coordinator with funding to report on sea level rise vulnerability and adaptation. Accepting the award, Senator Kalani English. He has one minute, I told him, one minute, one minute to tell us what he expects from the newly established law and what's next. Thank you, Senator. All that in one minute? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very appreciative. Yeah, I'm very appreciative of, of the recognition and the award. Um, you know, I think Governor has already established the, the task force and I think the first meeting has been set. So that'll be coming up very soon. Um, you know, for Hawaii, because we have to just look out the door, you know, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, we're more aligned with the Pacific Island countries than we are with North America in terms of um, environmental policy. And uh, the reality is, if you just look at the ocean, it is uh, encroaching more and more in. You can see it every day. So no matter where the politics lies on it, the reality is that we have to deal with it. Um, Going forward, I want you to take a look at what's called the Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them that the, uh, the came into force in 2015. Uh, it's an international accord and it's voluntary commitments. Um, but there's one section on clean energy, another on life below the ocean, which is um, what we just had the very large ocean summit on in New York at the UN. Uh, and all 17 um, are very, very important to us here in Hawaii. So I lay that before you think about go take a look at these uh, 17 goals um, 198 countries on around the world are implementing uh, these and looking at ways of implementing them uh, and we are 
preparing to do our part in that as well. So looking ahead, look at the sustainable development goals. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, we have been working on this for many, many years. I see Mina Morita here, and she and I were both the energy chairs way back when. Uh, when we were talking about these, these ideas and people were looking at us like, what are you talking about? Um, so here we are 15, 20 years later uh, taking on the problems. I want to thank all of you again. Thank you for this great honor. And thank you for your uh, work in making sure that uh, the policies we put in place uh, actually get implemented. Mahalo. Thank you. Guys, I just want to add something because uh, you're all probably wondering. We're in a special session right now, so you see legislators running in and out. Governor, we just passed bills uh, two and three, so right. that should be moving. You know, we have one, which Senate Bill One, which became Senate Bill Four, and I have to explain that um, because of I think miscommunication. The AG said that the title of the first bill was too narrow, and therefore would be unconstitutional. So we actually introduced Senate Bill Four on rail. So disregard Senate Bill One and follow Senate Bill 4, because <laughs> everybody's really confused about that. So Senate, four, Senate Bill 4 is the real bill. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Senator English. Um, for advancing energy technology, the forum recognizes the Hawaiian Electric Companies for its grid responsiveness, responsiveness distribution, energy storage, and management system. Because Hawaii leads the nation in integration of private customer-sited rooftop solar, Hawaiian Electric sought solutions for integrating the increasing level of rooftop while also ensuring safe and reliable power on the grid. Uh, no, easy, uh, no easy task. In January, Hawaiian Electric, uh, through this three-year $1.2 million initiative, it developed cost-effective monitoring and control system. In January, Hawaiian Electric successfully demonstrated almost one megawatt of intelligent energy storage systems spread among 29 Oahu commercial and industrial customer sites that supports grid management of variable renewables and helps customer manage their electricity costs. This capacity enables the utility to improve grid operations at the same time provide cost savings to customers. To, ex to accept the award is Scott Sue. No. no. Okay, Brennan <laughs> Morioko, sorry, um, who's the HECO's uh, general manager of the electrification of transportation, which is fitting for him to be here today. So, so Brennan, you want to sort of give us an update so where things are going from here? Sure, aloha. <clears throat> sorry, I'm not the same eye candy as Scott Seal, but... I'll have to do. Um, so thank you very much uh, to HEPF for, for this recognition. Uh, I do I want to acknowledge Elemental Accelerator for their participation in helping to fund uh, parts of this demonstration project. And then also recognition to some of our primary team leaders on this project, uh, Darren Ishimura, Dora Nakafuji, Yo Kawanami, and Mark Asano. So without their leadership in pushing this forward, uh, this, this project really uh, wouldn't be where it is today. Some of the next steps is, is really continuing this demonstration projects, evaluating the communication uh, network between uh, these businesses and our uh, operations, but also looking at uh, the data collection that's being done, and then also the integration of what we're able to do both on the, the customer side as well as on the operation side, with the ultimate goal, uh, like they had mentioned, is uh, reducing the cost for our customers and providing our customers with new types of technologies and services that currently aren't out there. So uh, we do look forward to some of the, the progress that we're going to be making over the next few years and then ultimately implementation on a permanent basis. So again, we want to just thank you very much for this recognition. Aloha.
it me? No, this is mine. Where's mine? Yes, yes, this is mine. Okay. Okay, the form recognizes specific biodiesel technologies for the integration between sectors in its Hawaii military biofuel crop project. Through this project, Pacific Biodiesel successfully collaborated with the Hawaii Army Garrison, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and local agricultural interests to demonstrate a sustainable system that could yield biofuel crops 100 days from soil to oil. The crops contribute to food, livestock feed, and renewable fuel. Pacific Biodiesel has taken the lessons it's learned to expand growing its most successful crops with its own finite financial resources. Accepting the award is Jo Galatro, uh, and she's gonna come up, Joy. <laughs> she's gonna tell us what's next. Well, our what's next, first of all, aloha, and thank you, Governor and Sharon, Mike, and the forum. Um, our what's next is happening now. We actually are building upon the strengths, all the lessons learned from our Hawaii Military Biofuel Crop Project, um, and really demonstrating at a larger scale now the economic feasibility that we can farm for biofuel crops, like these beautiful sunflowers here on Maui, uh, to create renewable fu uh, fuel and food and other high-value products that create local jobs and support the economy. And come see me at my table, and I will give you a sample of the high-value uh, value product, our mac nut oil that we're making. Uh, although federal funding for HMBC has ended, uh, earlier this year Pacific Biodiesel began farming uh, 115 acres we have here on Maui in Central Valley. It's the state's largest liquid biofuel crop project. We've leased one 100 acres. Um, we've acquired our combine harvester, other farm equipment, installed a new processing mill, so we're going forward. And in fact, that's Bob King our president. Today, he is harvesting our second crop. We've already planted 45 acres on former sugarcane land, and our first harvest was in June, and this is our second one today. Our sunflowers, yes, were eye-catching symbols of sustainability. They're also superstars on social media, and we're proud to showcase this community-based model of agriculture, clean energy, and food that offers clear hope for Hawaii's clean energy future. So mahalo. Sorry, lost in the paper here. Um, the edu Education and Outreach Award goes to Think Tech Hawaii for its media outreach, informing and engaging the public on clean energy, clean energy issues, policies, programs, and people. Way back in 2008, when, the energy, when energy and climate change were what were then called the hidden crisis, the forum obtained funding and sponsored for a documentary broadcast on KHON the climate crisis. It raised awareness but had limited shelf life. We tried again in 2011, partnered with, with Hawaii News Now and various sponsors. We produced a broadcast series of three seasons, but that was costly and although it was packed with information, it too came, to, came and went. Think Tech Hawaii has offered a solution in a video series in 2012 that's continued to support the program Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy in a weekly show that's streamed, uh, posted on YouTube and iTunes, and often broadcast on Alelo, uh, PEG Media, and Spectrum OIC 16. Today, it's not, the only, it only, not only continues that weekly show, but has also added five other energy shows focused on, uh, focused likewise on, and streamed, posted and broadcast on television. 
To accept the award is one who needs no introduction. In fact, he's been introduced a couple times today. Uh, <laughs> my friend and colleague, Jay Fidel. One word, Jay, one word. <laughs> the word is platform. Because uh, ThinkTech is a, think tech is a uh, nonprofit in the fullest extent of the, of the word. And um, I, you know, first I want to acknowledge, uh, I want to thank the Energy Policy Forum. We have really loved working with them all these years. Uh, doing these programs, doing the briefing in January, doing the Wednesday programs with them. Uh, it's really been a joy to work with them. They're a great organization. We would like to continue to do that forever. I want to, I want to thank our people. You know, we have our staff. Uh, we have our, our volunteer hosts. We have... Uh, thousands of guests who come by our studio and, and uh, participate in, uh, in talk shows. And we have our executive vice president over there, Carol Munley. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> she makes it run. So anyway, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm almost finished. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, we, we don't do energy. We, we showcase energy. We provide a platform for energy. And in that way, you know, we'd like to continue to help uh, the energy initiative going forward. And we will. We'll expand the number of shows. We'll expand the quality of our shows. We'll expand the distribution of our shows. And we hope that you'll all be on our shows if you haven't already. And if you have, we'd like you to be on our shows again. We'd like, <laughs> we'd like to give you guys, all of you guys, a platform to, uh, you know, to advance this initiative. Thank you so much for this award. I know you're all very hungry, but th there is one more the forum would like to honor. Uh, will Warren Bullmeyer please join us? He doesn't get to talk. He doesn't get to talk, but you know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> War Warren has led the Hawaii Renewable Energy Alliance since its founding in 1995, and he's been a stalwart member of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum as leading our Renewable Energy Working Group as chair. Uh, we present this certificate of service in advancing clean energy in Hawaii. Uh, mahalo and congratulations to Warren and HREA. And there is a certificate with a lots of words, but I know you're hungry, so you can ask Warren to look at it during lunch. And Warren, um, Joe is the chair of the HREA. You want to come up too, Joe, with, with Warren? Okay. And we'll take a little a picture or two, and then we'll break for lunch. But you must promise to come back at 105 sharp, because we're going to start, because we're really late. Thank you. Lunch is served in the courtyard, so if you want to leave others who want to take photos, the governor is going to be here with us, so you can bring your partners up and have a nice uh, photo up at the um, steps of the courtyard. Uh, and everybody else, please uh, follow uh, the leader. Mahalo.
about losing my... Uh... Yeah, 